Well, I wonder if you have any, <clears throat> any particular bodily feats uh, that you are uh, proud of, that you've experienced, not, your, not physical feat, but uh, bodily accomplishments, uh, things that have happened to you, things that you've done, uh, when, when you maybe had uh, an experience just thinking, man, I, uh, I did it, I accomplished it, and uh, man, I think about just uh, a workout, uh, getting a good workout in. Maybe you feel kind of the endorphins after you do that, go for a run or you lift some weights, whatever it may be. Uh, some of you, it's a, it's a long, hard day's work. You get to the end of a, a job that, that you use your body a lot. It's physical labor and you think, man, today was a, a good day of work. And just kind of those experiences in your body. And then there are, you know, any number of small accomplishments, uh, uh, and I'm going to give it away. Hannah often, at least when we first got married, used a uh, unique fact about her that she was able to lick her elbow um, as, a, as a physical feat. Um, she's since had three children, which is a physical feat as well. Um, in, uh, in seventh grade, when we started our middle school dating, she was also running track, and she won a, a sprint race. And her mom called me to... Uh, to uh, to tell me that she had won. And I didn't know how to respond because I was a seventh grade boy talking to my girlfriend's mom. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then later Hannah had an ankle injury which ended her what I'm sure would have been Olympic running career. Uh, <laughs> but you know, things like that. I've shared with you uh, one time when I was on a long run and I just had this feeling that I was gonna be able to run forever. Uh, I called it an, an out of leg experience. The fact that, uh, that uh, you know, I could just, my legs would keep on moving and eventually I had to, I had to just stop because I was worried that the next day I was gonna be sore. And I had this, this, this idea that I could have just kept going and going. Um, but man, that, uh, that actual forever is coming. Uh, and that's what the Bible points us to. You know, as we've talked last week and this week about uh, what our bodies will be like at the end of all things. Uh, we are in heaven. Uh, sometimes you just get into the realm of speculation, as Noel kind of introduced us to in the welcome. We don't really know what we'll look like. We don't know uh, exactly what we'll feel like or what things we will do or won't do or will be able to do. But the question under all of those questions, when we start to speculate, we talked last week about how the question under the question is, will I be satisfied? Will I enjoy heaven? And the resounding answer in scripture is, yes, absolutely you will. And whether it turns out how you anticipate it will turn out, whether you look the way that you, you hope to look or, or don't, you will deeply enjoy heaven. And as we continue in 1 Corinthians 15, if you turn with me there, we're going to start in verse 35. Paul reminds us that resurrection is the feet that we're meant to stand on. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope of our own resurrection. And when we will stand on resurrected feet. Uh, verse 35 through 41 of uh, 1 Corinthians 15. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. And star differs from star in splendor. And so Paul talks about how we will experience the death of one kind of flesh. And then he moves into these, these metaphors, these ways of thinking about different bodies. And he thinks about uh, bodies in the sky, like the moon and the stars. And, and when Paul moves into these metaphors, it's because it's so difficult for us to comprehend. Because we've never experienced heaven, and we won't experience heaven until we die, ultimately. Right? There are people who've had near-death experiences, and, and we receive warnings from theologians about trusting those more, more than we trust Scripture. And, and people can really just tell us what they felt like, but, but we don't know if they actually experienced heaven or if it was something else. And so Paul, as he, as he begins describing our, our heavenly bodies to us, 
is encouraging us not to think of them just like these bodies, uh, but as, as whole new bodies. And that's the thing about thinking about our heavenly bodies is that it's so difficult to describe. And so we have to resort to, to metaphors and analogies and, and, and best attempts that we can give. At one time I was listening to a, a sermon by Pastor David Platt. And he was talking about hell, the, the opposition to heaven, an eternal separation from God. And he was saying, you know, a lot of times people think about hell and they, they, they look at scriptures that, that talk about hell and describe hell. And they say, well, maybe that's just a metaphor. And David Platt said, what is a metaphor but to help us describe something that we otherwise can't put into words? And so in thinking about hell, you know, a, a burning eternal fire it's the worst thing that those people could, could think of, this physical torment. And so as we think about heaven, Paul is trying to, to describe in the best way that God gives him what it's going to be that we are going to have new bodies in heaven. And so it's difficult to understand exactly. And we could come up with, with all kinds of different metaphors. I mean, as I was writing, I, was, I thought, well, you know, maybe it's kind of like identical twins, right? You, they're, they're the same, but they're different there's some difference involved there, and people who know them intimately can, can tell the difference between them, uh, but they, they come from uh, the same genetics. Uh, somehow, our heavenly body is going to be different, but we know that we will have a body. Uh, Thomas, when Jesus is re resurrected, we looked last week at John chapter 20, uh, where Thomas inspects the, the body of the resurrected Jesus. He, he, he sees the scars in Jesus' hands, and Jesus says, put your hand in my side uh, where the spear went in. And, and so Thomas is able to inspect and investigate and see, uh, touch the body of Jesus resurrected. You and I will have resurrected bodies just like Jesus did. Even if it's hard to understand exactly what those bodies will be like. We also know that it was difficult for some people to recognize Jesus. Mary in the garden didn't recognize Jesus initially. The, the two people on the road to Emmaus who talk with Jesus don't recognize him the whole time they're talking. And then he breaks the bread and he's gone. And then they realize, ah, that was Jesus. So there's something about Jesus' body that's, that's similar. He still has the scars, but there's something about his body that's, that's different enough that people aren't able to recognize him. And as we think about our own resurrected bodies, we, we think about Jesus and we think about uh, the body that Jesus himself had after the resurrection. You know, Paul goes on as he continues to try to explain this in verse 42. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Uh, one difficulty for, for us in kind of Western culture is in verse 44 when it says it's raised a spiritual body. We tend to think of spiritual bodies as maybe angels or maybe even ghosts, uh, something that's non-physical. Uh, a spiritual body, we think, is, is something that kind of floats around, that drifts around, but, uh, but, but can't touch things, can't hold on to things. And this is true in, in pop culture and TV shows um, and, and other beliefs about, I mean, I, uh, we were at a at the Mayborn Museum, several, maybe I think last January sometime um, with, uh, with the boys and they had a, a space exhibit and there was a little video about uh, an astronaut who had to have oxygen and it showed, well, if, if the astronaut doesn't have oxygen, then he dies. And it showed a little, uh, a little kind of ghostly figure coming out of the man's body and it had wings on its back. And that's how we think of our spiritual bodies as these ghostly angel things that don't really have any substance to them. But, but that, friends, is, is Platonism. So Plato was a philosopher who lived 400 years before Jesus. And that's how he thought about the afterlife. That we get rid of our physical bodies, that, uh, that our bodies are inhibiting us. So we need, to, we need to get rid of them and just be these spiritual ghostly things. But when Paul says spiritual body here... He's not saying a ghostly thing that, that floats around, but it is a real body. Uh, Jerry Walls in his book, Heaven, The Logic of Eternal Joy, says if God is perfectly good, 
as well as supremely powerful, then he surely has both the ability and the desire not only to make himself known to us, but also to preserve and perfect his relationship with us if we are willing. And that includes our bodies. When we enter into heaven, we don't go to a lesser world, but we don't go to a less real world. And from now on, when you hear the phrase spiritual body or, or heavenly body, thinking about your body in heaven, I want you to think better body. Uh, not, not a ghostly body, not a body that floats around, but a, a better body. And as I mentioned, nobody has ever experienced heaven uh, unless these near-death experiences are actual experiences of heaven, but, but we don't put our hope ultimately in that. Um, if they are help at all, they, they are in the sense that they confirm things that Scripture says. Uh, John Burke looks at, uh, I gave this book away some time ago, it was called Imagine Heaven. And in that book, John Burke looks at a lot of different near-death experiences and says, if these things are true, which, you know, maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but if they're true, and then he maps Scripture onto them. He says, maybe this is what it means in Scripture when it, when it talks about this way of our body being. You know, Paul here, he says it's uh, sown perishable, raised imperishable, from dishonor to glory, from weakness to power, from natural to spiritual. So in each of those, Paul gives you know, maybe not so good or, or bad, and then good or better. Our heavenly body is going to be better than this body that we experience. And so if those things are true that people have experienced in, in near-death experiences— Again, we shouldn't put too much stock in those, but they're a way to sort of enliven our imagination as we ask the questions that Noel was asking about. The question under the question, will I be satisfied? We can ask ourselves, man, is this a way that God will, will satisfy the desires that he has given me? And is this a way that I will be able to worship God more fully? And so as we think about really practical questions like, can we eat all the junk food that we want? Right? Or, or will we be able to see better? Or will my knees stop hurting? Or whatever it is for you. Right? We can ask ourselves, is this a way that I will be able to worship and love God more? And somebody who studied these, studied these near-death experiences a lot is Dr. Jeffrey Long. Dr. Jeffrey Long is a radiation oncologist, and he actually has a website. It's the letters N-D-E-R-F, which is Near Death Experience Research Foundation.org. N-D-E-R-F.org. And you can read people's kind of near-death experiences. If you want to read those, that's great. You should also read scripture. Okay? Read the Bible to educate you more than people's near-death experiences. But if you it can help you enliven your imagination. And uh, Dr. Long has done enough research that he eventually wrote his own book called Evidence of the Afterlife, The Science of Near-Death Experiences. And he says that in two-thirds of the people that he's interviewed about these experiences, uh, they, they have this, uh, this experience of heightened, unworldly brightness in their vision, clarity and vividness. Some people describe having a 360-degree ability to see things. They can see all around them. Other people talk about being kind of being able to, to telescope, to be able to see what's far away as if it's nearby without having to physically go there. And so, again, Scripture doesn't give us a definitive picture of what our vision will be like in heaven. But those are just ways of saying it will be better than it is now. And something about it being better is, is it gives us the ability to worship the Lord better and to enjoy him more. To, to just love every moment that we are with him without the brokenness of sin that we experience in this life. Every difficulty we face, every frustration we have, every change that we would want to make about our body is due to either sin of our thoughts or sin that has impacted our bodies. And in heaven, sin will be no more. And we can give thanks to God for that. And man, we could try and think of so many other metaphors. Recently, it's, it's been a little chilly in the morning, and man, I'm a wimp when it comes to the cold, okay? Uh, and so I, uh, if it's like below 60 degrees, I've got a hat and gloves on probably, um, especially if the sun's not out. So there are a couple of times recently I've, I've gone for a run, and I've had my hat and gloves on. 
And, and lots of you, I'm sure, have experienced when you've got your gloves on, you maybe can't deal with your phone. If, if they're older gloves and they don't have the special fabric on the fingers, you know, that helps you touch your phone. And so I have to kind of pull the thumb and the index finger off my gloves and, and then mess with my phone, get a music or a podcast or something going, and then I'll put my glove back on. Uh, our heavenly bodies will, will be like when, when we take gloves off. Right? When I take the gloves off, I don't say, well, I don't have a body anymore. No, my, my body is able to interact more with the environment around me when I take the gloves off. I, I can interact with, I can touch things, I can feel things even more than I could with the gloves on. But maybe you've tried to fiddle with, fiddle with your keys or do something fine motor when you've got these gloves on and you, you just can't do it because these gloves are getting in the way. The gloves are still good. They keep me warm, right? So I don't dislike the gloves. Our bodies in this life are good. God has given them to us. And in the next life, they will be even better. We'll be able to interact with the world that God has created even more in in a fuller way. uh, Maybe we can think about it like, like waking up as well. I'm sure you, you've taken a nap and you've, kinda, you've woken up and, and you kind of had to come out of this fog or whatnot. Or maybe there was something that happened in the middle of the night and you wake up and, and you don't really remember it, but you know that something happened? I asked Brandon if I could tell uh, a story that he shared with me. Uh, so several, uh, several weeks before Jolie was born, uh, there, uh, a cat got sick in the middle of the night at their house and, um, and Kaylee woke up and she started kind of getting materials to clean it got some paper towels, and she came over to Brandon's side of the bed, and she said, can you help me? And Brandon says, sure. He grabbed the paper towels, he tore one off, and he handed them back to her. <laughs> now, Brandon asked me, when I, told, when I asked if I could tell the story, he said, just make sure you tell everybody I'm a loving and good husband. <laughs> I said, I'll tell them you tore that paper towel better than anybody else. But we've all had experiences like that, where we, we wake up and, and, you know, we know something's going on, but we're not quite with it yet. And that's, that's, what, that's what this life is like. We're here. We're present. We're participating in God's creation. We have important things to do. God invites us into his work. And that work is telling people, look, there's a greater day ahead of you. And don't you want to be with the Lord? Because he loves you. And all the best experiences you've had in this life are a joke in comparison to what you can have when it's all said and done. And that's what Paul is telling us here. The body that's sown is perishable, but it's raised imperishable. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown a natural body and raised a spiritual body. Paul goes on in in the middle of verse 44 there. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spirit did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. And so we, we might not know exactly what our physical body is going to be like. But we see Jesus, who was resurrected, And Paul says here, just like you were were like Adam, you're going to be like Christ. The first heavenly man, the the first fruits of those to be resurrected. And we talked last week about how Jesus in John chapter 20 shows up, has kind of a fish fry for his disciples. And now it doesn't specifically say Jesus ate the food, but it also doesn't say Jesus didn't eat the food. Maybe in heaven we will eat. Jesus uses lots of metaphors of of a banquet, being at a wedding banquet, a big feast. So it's it's well within the realm of possibilities that we will eat food. We might eat food just because we want to, because we won't need it. 
in John chapter 20 as well, Jesus at two different points in the chapter, we're told that the doors are locked, but Jesus showed up. And did Jesus walk through a wall? Did he walk through the door? Did they, did they leave out the part where they opened the door for him? I tend to doubt it because in Acts, Peter shows up and he has to knock on the door and, and they say, it's, it's not really Peter, it's his spirit. Jesus shows up in the room, even though it's locked. Whether he walks through a wall or, or just appears there, and again, we, we're kind of entering the realm of speculation. We don't know exactly what it's going to be like. But something about our body after this, everything about our body, will be better than the body that we have now. And we can praise God for that. I mean, it's difficult, though, because we don't, we didn't, we don't interact with people who have died. We don't interact with people who are heaven, so we can't, we can't get a first-hand account. We can't ask them, hey, what, it's, what is it like? We have these near-death experiences, but like I've said, there, there are some things that are very similar about them, and maybe in that way, as they accord with Scripture, they point us to truth. But, but even that, there's only so much. We, can, we have to speculate about it. And a lot of theologians talk about what they call an intermediate state. We'll talk more about this next week as we look at uh, 1 Thessalonians. Um, but it's the idea that we've, uh, we've talked before about the already but not yet, right? Jesus already died on the cross, and he rose again. He defeated death, but he's not yet culminated that victory in the end of all things. And so we're waiting for him to come back. In the same way, people that we've loved who have passed, passed away are in heaven, uh, but, uh, but people call it the intermediate state. It's not the ultimate heaven. Now, hear me clearly, I'm not saying purgatory. The scripture does not teach that, well, you've got some extra chances after you die. You can kind of learn some more, and you must make that decision before you die to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe in him. But in, in 1 Thessalonians, which we'll look at next week, Paul talks about how those who have fallen asleep will be raised in their new bodies. And this, use, this language of sleep gets used a lot. Again, we'll, we'll look into that more next week. But there's a sense in which what we experience now is, is real life. And then when, when we die and we go to heaven, what some people call the intermediate state before Jesus comes back, that will be real-er life, more real life. And then when Jesus comes back, and he raises those who have fallen asleep, that will be the realest version of life that we can ever experience. And we look forward to that day. Jesus ate food when he was resurrected. In Revelation, he's shown riding a horse. We say, well, you know, maybe that's a maybe that's a metaphor. Maybe. Or maybe Jesus will actually be riding a horse. Maybe we'll ride horses. Uh, some of you who are, are friends on Facebook with my predecessor, Jeff Gravens, uh, know that he's in Cambodia currently teaching some other pastors, and um, he had posted a picture of his meal. And uh, Katie, his wife, commented and said, you are in heaven with that meal. And I just thought, man, will heaven be the greatest meals we've ever wanted? Will we, we be able to eat the greatest foods Will I be able to blank in my heavenly body? Will my heavenly body be able to blank, fill in the blank with whatever? Maybe, maybe not. But the thing that we can trust is that we will enjoy our heavenly bodies. And we will have heavenly bodies. Because scripture tells us that we will. And that's a hope for us of heaven. That we are going to experience something phenomenal. Paul goes on, verse 50, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. 
We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. For the imperishable must clothe itself, the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And so Paul is telling us here, look, be prepared. And Paul fully anticipated that Jesus would return in his day. That's what I think he's saying when he says, we will not all sleep. And we are encouraged to have that same attitude. We should fully expect that Jesus will come back today, that he could come back tomorrow, he could come back Tuesday, and be prepared for his return. Because Scripture tells us that no one knows the day or the hour, but it will be a glorious day for those of us that have chosen to follow Jesus. I was reading a book recently, Letters to a Future Saint by Brad East. And in this little book, he writes two to three page letters. It's a great kind of introductory to theology. Um, Don't agree with 100% of it, but it's a good book to kind of get you started on things. And in the book, he he talks about how, you know, people object. Well, we've been waiting 2,000 years now for Jesus to come back, and he still hasn't. And Peter himself, the apostle, addressed that in Scripture. He said that God is not slow in keeping his promises, but he is patient. And East in his book says, you know, if God hadn't been patient for 2,000 years, you reading this book wouldn't be part of the story. So can't we say thank you, God, that he is patient so that we can be part of his story. And at the same time, we say, come, Lord Jesus. And we all look forward to to having a new body. Tammy's funeral on Friday was really a, I think I said before, a, a moment of worship for me. Being able to celebrate her love for the Lord and her demonstration of him to those around her. And the encouragement that she was. And knowing now that she is rejoicing with the Lord in heaven. You know, the practical questions come for her as well. They showed a slideshow and saw pictures of her, saw her before she had cancer, and kind of asked, man, does she have her pre-cancer body? And again, the answer is, I don't know, but it's better. Whatever it is, it's better. And if you've chosen to follow Jesus, it will be better. And we're invited to invite others in to know the love of Christ so that they too can receive something better. Even if the answer to a lot of our questions is, I don't know. That's what faith is, right? Not knowing exactly, not being able to maybe articulate everything precisely, but but trusting what you can articulate. Trusting that that Jesus came, he lived a life, he was a man just like any other man, a Jewish man of his day. He lived without sin. He died a death that he didn't deserve, but he wanted to die so that we could be made right with God. He was the, the, the sacrifice for our sins. And then he rose again, giving hope for our resurrection, demonstrating his power over death so that Those who follow after him, put their faith in him, would one day overcome death as well. We can't explain exactly how it works. I've talked about how Jesus seemed to Sabbath in the grave. That's my interpretation of things, but I don't know what Jesus was doing. I, I can't explain it to you perfectly. And we trust the promise that Jesus gave in John chapter 14, that he has gone ahead of us to prepare a place and he will come back to retrieve us. And Jesus was here with his resurrected body. And now we don't see him. He's veiled from our sight. But people saw his resurrected body, so we know that he's making good on his promise. 
Paul closes the chapter in verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Stand firm, Paul says. Hope. Trust that you will be clothed with the imperishable, with the glorious, with the powerful, with the spiritual body. And act in that regard. Invite others in. Let let the kingdom come now, as Jesus himself prays in the Gospels. In the way that you treat others. In the way that you live your life. Live in the expectation that you will one day be in the presence of God. And so that reality should should educate how, how we attempt to live now because that life is the most joyous life. And one day God will do things that we cannot do, that we are incapable of doing. Raise the dead. Jesus stood in his resurrected body on this earth. And then John, when he was exiled, has a vision of Jesus as well. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, we're told that among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. So we get this reminder that Jesus' body will be glorious, imperishable, powerful, and spiritual at the end of all things. And you and I will receive bodies like that as well. Thanks be to God. Resurrection, a resurrected body, is the feet you're meant to stand on. In resurrection, having a resurrected body, is the hope that you are meant to share. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you show us the risen Lord Jesus that he came and stood among his apostles, seemingly getting through a locked door without it opening twice. And God, that that John has this image of Jesus and his glorious, imperishable, spiritual, powerful body. And God, we thank you that for all the questions that we can't answer about, about what heaven will be like, We thank you that we can answer the one that matters most, and that is that we will deeply enjoy it because we will be more fully what you created us to be, and we will be worshiping in your presence. And God, I pray that you would compel us to continue to meditate on that hope to continue to share that hope with others and to invite them to know that they too can one day have a spiritual, imperishable, powerful, glorious body. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.